is written in the Gospel according to Luke, the 24th chapter. The Gospel lesson today, beautiful. And it's, uh, this is the, the story of the road to Emmaus, or the way to Emmaus, and it's always read on the, this, the third Sunday of Easter every year, so it becomes very familiar, which can be good or bad, because <laughs> we get so familiar we don't really hear it. And so today, as I read it, and you read along with me, I would encourage you to think about, is there a, uh, a word or a phrase or a thought that, that stands out for you today as you think about the gospel reading? And to help us too, I, I thought I would read it from Eugene Peterson's The Message translation, as it's not much different, but just enough it kind of makes you think a little bit uh, differently about the, the text. So uh, you can follow along and hear this Similar translation, this now from Luke 24. That same day, two of them were walking to the village Emmaus, about seven miles out of Jerusalem. They were deep in conversation, going over all these things that had happened. In the middle of their talk and questions, Jesus came up and walked along with them. But they were not able to recognize who he was. He asked, what's this you're discussing so intently as you walk along? They just stood there, long-faced, like they had lost their best friend. Then one of them, his name Cleopas, said, are you the only one in Jerusalem who hasn't heard what's happened during the last few days? How great is that? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, what else Jesus respond with? Well, Tell me, what has happened? <laughs> they said, the things that happened to Jesus the Nazarene. He was a man of God, a prophet, dynamic in work and word, blessed by both God and all the people. Then our high priests and leaders betrayed him, got him sentenced to death and crucified him. And we had hopes that he, up, we had our hopes up that he was the one, the one about to deliver Israel. And it is now the third day since it happened. But now some of our women have completely confused us. Early this morning they were at the tomb and couldn't find his body. They came back with the story that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of our friends went off to the tomb to check and found it empty just as the women said, but they didn't see Jesus. Then he said to them, so thick-headed, slow, so slow-hearted, why can't you simply believe all that the prophets said? Don't you see that these things had to happen, that the Messiah had to suffer and only then enter into his glory? Then he started at the beginning with the books of Moses and went on through the prophets, pointing out everything in the scriptures that referred to him. They came to the edge of the village where they were headed. He acted as if he were going on, but they pressed him. Stay and have supper with us. It's nearly evening. The day is done. So he went in with them, and here is what happened. He sat down at the table with them. Taking the bread, he blessed and broke and gave it to them. At that moment, open-eyed, wide-eyed, they recognized him. And then he disappeared. Back and forth they talked. Didn't we feel on fire as he conversed with us on the road, as he opened up the scriptures for us? They didn't waste a minute. They were up and on their way back to Jerusalem. They found the 11 and their friends gathered together, talking away. It's really happened. The master has been raised up. Simon saw him. Then the two went over everything that happened on the road and how they recognized him when he broke the bread. This is word of God, word of life. Praise, Praise to you, Christ. You may be seated. <clears throat> so what, what uh, anything in particular that stood out for you today in there? Maybe just a word, a phrase, a thought? Are you so thick-headed? So thick-headed. <laughs> 
how come you can't, how come you can't figure this out? None of us would be like that, though, right? <laughs> Anything else? I like when they, the fact that they realized they were burning inside when they, you know, there was something, it's like they didn't realize it at the time, and then they're like, oh my gosh, we had this. Yeah. Maybe sometimes you don't realize it right away. Yeah, isn't that beautiful? There was a spark that ignited when Jesus opened up the scripture for them. How he kept their eyes uh, kind of shielded to who he was until he broke the bread. That uh, was interesting. Yeah, but it was in uh, one reason as Lutherans why we, we like to have communion every Sunday, right? We get Christ revealed in the breaking of the bread, the drinking of the wine. Yeah, that's beautiful, beautiful imagery, isn't it? Uh, anything else? There's, there's a lot there, isn't there? <laughs> I was struck by the fact that they, um, when they talked about God, uh, about Jesus as being a prophet and a leader, and they hoped that he was the one who would free Israel and, and so forth, that they never mentioned about his being the son of God. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's the words, the phrase that they used, that they, they weren't, couldn't figure out. They, they had hoped that he was the one, right? And they didn't even quite know what to say about Jesus and what to help him in. That's a great uh, segue, so thank you, Phil, to uh, kind of what stood out for me, and that is um, there was a real sense of discouragement, right? They had hoped for something, and it didn't, it seemed like it had turned out to be a total failure. And so they were this tremendous sense of, of uh, discouragement. Now, have any of you ever been through a time of discouragement or disappointment? No. Anybody? No. <laughs> I think we, have, we all have a problem, don't we? And, you know, some of you might even be living in a season of discouragement right now. And for others, a season of discouragement could be just around the corner. And if you're going through a time of discouragement, uh, we have some good news today, right? <laughs> Some really good news as we learn that Jesus meets us along the road and offers us surprising faith and hope. There, and that's actually a picture of what would be part of the road to Emmaus that they were walking along that day. And the gospel lesson then, it continues kind of the narratives of Easter and the, the resurrection appearances of Jesus being raised from the dead or following that, that event. And today we are told in this text, the Gospel text, that it was Sunday, the day that Jesus was raised from the dead. And later that day, two of the disciples were walking along this similar piece of that road right there to Emmaus. And that was about a seven miles, about seven miles west of Jerusalem. And um, we're told that at some point along that road, Jesus comes up alongside of them and starts walking with them. And he's kind of listening in, and of course they don't recognize him, and they're filled with discouragement. And we're told typically that would have been about a two and a half hour walk, and so they would have a lot of time to converse, and we can imagine how they must have felt. Everything they hoped for looked like it was a total failure. Nothing, but they were feeling this deep sense of death and grief of what had happened. We assume they were at Jerusalem and saw Jesus, his crucifixion. They saw him die that terrible death on the cross. So Jesus comes up alongside of them, and verse 17 and 21. What are, Jesus asks, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? Because he knows. You've got to <laughs> I mean, you can imagine Jesus has a great sense of humor, right, to you? Well, what are you guys talking about? <laughs> Why? Uh, they, so they stood looking sad. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel, right? Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. And so there, you know, we, we had hoped for something that didn't happen. These friends, they were counting on Jesus to redeem the people of Israel, to rescue their nation from its enemies. And they were, of course, expecting a military and political savior. And so they thought that this Jesus was a total failure. 
They didn't realize that he had come to rescue the people from sin or from our human brokenness and to restore us uh, back into a renewed relationship with God. And these disciples were so focused on their discouragement that they didn't recognize then that Jesus was walking alongside of them. And, and I can relate to that. And maybe you can too. Because God doesn't usually work the way that I expect or, or want God to work. And so the disciples said, well, we, we, we had hoped, right? And have you ever hoped for something and it just didn't work out the way you wanted or planned? It might be like something like we had hoped our child would recover, or we had hoped that this job would last, or we had hoped that a better outcome for this relationship. Relationships can be the most beautiful things in life, but the most disappointing and discouraging, can't they? Maybe we had hoped for a, a, something different relationship with our child, or sibling, or parent, or romantic relationship that we hoped for something that just didn't work out. Or maybe we had hoped that the illness would go into remission. A few things can be more painful than dashed hopes. And if you're experiencing dashed hopes right now, you can understand why Easter is so important. Because Jesus comes alongside of us and opens the scripture for us. And at Easter, we learn that God is the master of turning crucifixions into resurrections. And God loves to bring new life from the dark tomb. God wants to bring new possibilities out of what look to be dead ends. And God works in unexpected ways. And the disciples are disappointed in part because they misunderstood how God was working to save the world. They're expecting a God of power. They got, a, they got a God of vulnerability. They're expecting a warrior God. And they got a suffering servant. And this is the Jesus who is walking with them and they didn't recognize him. And I wonder, because we often expect something different from God, I wonder how often Jesus is walking with us and we don't even recognize it, especially in times of discouragement. And I'm reminded of a story I wanted to share with you. It's a story that's been around a while, so you may have heard it, but I think it's worth re repeating. It's a true story. This is from back in 2007. A man sat at a metro station in Washington, D.C. and started to play the violin. It was a cold January morning. He played six Bach pieces for about 45 minutes. During that time, since, since it was rush hour, it was calculated that thousands of people went through the station, most of them on their way to work. Three minutes went by and a middle-aged man noticed there was a musician playing. He slowed his pace and stopped for a few seconds and then hurried up to meet his schedule. A minute later, the violinist received his first dollar tip. The woman threw the money in the till and without stopping, continued to walk. A few minutes later, someone leaned against the wall to listen to him, but the man looked at his watch and started to walk again. Clearly, he was late for work. The one who paid the most attention was a three-year-old boy. His mother tagged him along, hurrying, but the child stopped to look at the violinist. Finally, the mother pushed hard and the child continued to walk, turning his head all the time. This action was repeated by several other children. All the parents, without exception, forced them to move on. In the 45 minutes the musician played, only six people stopped and stayed for a while. About 20 gave him money, but continued to walk their normal pace. He collected $32. When he finished playing and silence took over, no one noticed. No one applauded, nor was there any recognition. No one knew this, but the violinist was Joshua Bell, one of the best musicians in the world. He had played one of the most intricate pieces ever written, with a violin worth three and a half million dollars. Two, 
days before his plane in the subway, Joshua Bell sold out at a theater in Boston, and the seats averaged over $100. This is a real story. Joshua Bell playing incognito in the metro station was organized by the Washington Post as part of a social experiment about perception, taste, and priorities of people. The outlines were in a commonplace environment at an inappropriate hour. Do you perceive beauty? And we might add to that today. Or do, do we recognize talent and beauty in very unexpected ways, huh? places? And for us today, do we take the time to stop and notice the beauty that's around us? And most importantly, do we notice that Jesus is walking with us? Do we have our eyes, ears open enough to notice Jesus walking? Or is it more like Joshua Bell? He's going away. Well, Jesus meets us along the road and offers us faith and hope. And interesting, before Jesus interprets the scriptures to the disciples on the road, um, before he breaks bread, he does two things. And maybe this was important. It was mentioned that it was, took a while before they recognized him. A couple of things he did that were important. He, he comes alongside the discouraged disciples. And first of all, he asks them to name their laws. And you know, naming our, our pain, our grief, our loss, our essential ingredients to, to move beyond them. And did you hear the words in the psalm today, 116 verse 3? It says, the psalmist writes, The cords of death entangled me. The anguish of the grave came upon me. I came to grief and sorrow. Whew. Now that's an honest prayer, isn't it? <laughs> naming the pain, the grief, that that person was, was feeling. Huh? It's often in, the, in our pain that we learn to pray our most authentic prayers. But then in verse 4, it says, Then I called upon the name of the Lord. So we, we pray our honest prayers, and then, then we, we, we go to God in trust. Right? And think for a moment then, what, what are you grieving about or, or fearing or or uh, disappointed over or discouraged? Is there something you know, you're, you're, that's causing you anxiety, fear, grief? What, what, what might that be? What might that be? And then I think Jesus would give you encouragement to, to, to name that, to name that pain, mm -hmm. and to go to God and trust, trusting that God can help carry that burden, lift that burden. Lift that burden from you. So it's important that we name those things that we can be then surprised by how God can come to us with hope and God's loving presence. And I think about us as a community of, of faith, that we should be a place where people can be honest about disappointments and anxiety and fears that, that we're experiencing, right? We tend to think the church is where we get dressed up and have to sh put our best foot forward, our best whatever forward, when really, it's quite the opposite, I think, isn't it? This place that we would be able to share the pains that we're experiencing, the sorrows, that, that we can experience God's healing, right? God's hope. Because it's here that, that Jesus meets us along the road and wants to walk up alongside of us. And then also as we, as we, as individuals and as a congregation, as we think about sharing our faith with others, Jesus offers a, us a very helpful pattern here. Before we talk, before we explain, before we invite, we come alongside of others, and what should we do? Simply listen. We don't have to solve anybody's problem, we just listen. And you know, we are, you and I are often in the presence of Jesus walking alongside of people around us. Yeah? We, that they can see Jesus in you, you and me as well. 
as we just walk alongside and listen, just be present. And I'm, I'm here with you. And you know, it's, it's important for people, each of us, to know that we're not alone. That we can bring our hopes, whether they're dashed or, or growing, and our questions, whether they're spoken or, or questions lingering in the, in the depths of our heart, and that this community, that we, are not just to welcome them, but we are to, to love them and walk with them, right? And you all know that because you do that with one another, right? But that's the power of how we incorporate other people into the body of Christ is as we walk alongside of them. We don't have to convince or beat anybody with the Bible or any of that, right? Or we don't have to throw passages of scripture out. I think Jesus would give us a bottle today that says, yeah, just come alongside and walk and listen and hear people's stories. So as we gather here then each Sunday, our worship follows the pattern then of the events on the road to Emmaus. We gather along the road our, our life journey. The scriptures are proclaimed. The risen Christ appears to us as bread is blessed and broken and wine is poured here in this place, in this moment. And then we can be filled with hope. And then we are sent out to tell others about God's surprising faith and hope that is found in Jesus. And all God's people say, 